surgery and technique did you use to work prosthetics with your mind? My legs are bionic. So when I'm an EXO, I can stand and have a conversation with high Two weeks before high school graduation, I was 18 years old. Osteo means bone. Uh, integration, integration with the bone, of the bone, the inner core. He's the first person to get the implant in the United States. So I think closed hand and that, that robotic hand went closed like that. Man, I come by, yeah, I want to come out of that chair so bad. Remember, deep breath, relax. The biggest motivation is I have a second chance on life. I could have lost my life with cancer. I had three of my children that were in the service to come back with all their extremities, but some of their buddies didn't. I want to be the best role model to forward on the prosthetic field. I want to better a lot of lives. Nice. Sometimes the biggest challenge is slowing Johnny down. Every single time we work together, he shows me that there's far more by pushing the envelope that results in practical application, and it's forcing me to adapt things that I might not have thought of before. <laughs> Right now, with kind of the man-machine integration, Johnny has narrowed that gap to the smallest distance that it has ever been. Yeah, I, I was a very strange child. I would sit in the basement, no sound, silence, and I'd just sit there and rock. And I'd do this for hours and hours and hours. I think my parents thought I was insane, but what I was doing is imagining futures, imagining what life could be. When I was 17 with my climbing partner, Jeff Batzer, we ice climbed Huntington's Ravine on Mount Washington. We got disoriented in a complete blizzard and spent the next several days trying to get ourselves out to civilization. We made it within a few miles of the roadway and we couldn't walk. Our lower limbs were completely frostbitten, completely numb. Luckily, someone was out snowshoeing, saw human tracks, and we were plucked from the mountain via helicopter. Then I spent, you know, months in the hospital. Gangrene had set in, was slowly making its way on my body. And it was clear that amputation was necessary. About 12 months after my limbs were amputated, I was climbing at the same level as I had before the accident. And people started to get nervous. And then I exceeded that level and started to climb walls that no one ever climbed before. And then I became a threat. And that happened overnight. Some of my climbing colleagues actually threatened to cut their own legs off to achieve the same unfair advantage as me. <laughs> no one actually did it. The fact that I could design my body part and exceed what I had achieved before and even exceed what nature intended was very inspiring because I realized that technology has the power to heal, to rehabilitate, and to even extend human experience and human capability. That set me on this trajectory of, of tinkering, of designing, of climbing, and then going back to the shop and whittling and carving and machining. I mean, my closet looked really funny. <laughs> the motor mimics our calf muscles, adding positive force to the prosthesis, and that propels the body forward. This is especially helpful for walking up ramps and stairs. So that even though the limb is made of titanium and carbon and all these synthetic materials, it moves as if it's made of flesh and bone. The value of closely respecting the biophysics is that when we fit this prosthesis to a human body, there's often no training. Because the human body remembers how to walk. Oh my God, I can't believe it! <laughs> That's the value of this biomimetic design approach. We built our first foot ankle in 2002, so it's been a long iterative process. Probably uh, 30 fundamentally different designs that led to the, the bionic limb uh, as, it, as it exists today. We're studying how the tissues in this part of my body, how stiff they are, we're studying how the skin moves. And we, we then 3D print structures that emulate those tissue properties. It looks like a topographical map of your residual limb, and it makes for one of the most comfortable sockets available today. Electrical impulses in the muscles of the residual limb, and then translate that into movement. Thus, the user only has to think about moving their leg to activate the bionic limb. I have the condition that my limbs are amputated. But that condition, because of great technology, I have the quality of life that I seek. 
extending that story across all of humanity. One can imagine a world in which technology is so remarkably great that we can eliminate disability. And I believe that will happen in this century. The twilight years of this century, there will be no disability in the world. One of the things that I've learned being in a wheelchair is that the world looks down at you. And people don't mean to, but you're not at eye level with anyone. So when I'm an EXO, I can stand and have a conversation eye to eye. Two weeks before high school graduation, I was 18 years old. Five friends and myself were driving to a friend's lake house. We were driving late at night and there was road construction. They didn't mark the road or even have construction signs out. I didn't see the turn coming and I drove straight off a 600 foot cliff. Exobionics is basically ground zero for exoskeletons. So we do all the design work here, we do all the manufacturing here, we do prototyping here, we do testing here. In the early days, we, we tried to find what we call our test pilots to, to help us evaluate and improve the exoskeleton, kind of like first flight, and it's the first time using exoskeletons. Each test pilot is paired up with a trained physical therapist who closely monitors the test pilot's movements and guides them through the rehabilitation process. So the exoskeleton helps support Matt to stand up. With that, the exoskeleton legs are the external support for him and actually distributes the weight of the device through the ground. And then it allows Matt to actually weight bear through his own bones. We have adjustability in the lower leg and the upper leg. What you see here is the hip motor and the knee motor that actually helps to power the leg and actually replicates the muscles. We have lithium ion batteries as the power source and a computer that's essentially the backpack. So there's an interface on the crutch that helps Matt to be more autonomous with the walking. He can initiate that walk cycle, shift his weight, find that balance point, and trigger his first initial step. I'd been in a wheelchair for three years before I first walked in EXO. And that day that I got to stand again was very emotional. There was a mission at the end of the day, and we wanted to make a robot that helped people. And I was excited to be part of the team that did that. So I see a future of exoskeletons where people are grabbing them out of their garage to go on a run through the mountains so they can cover much more ground because of the exo. I think there's a ton of applications for them in the future, and it's just the more we can get it out there, the more ubiquitous it'll be. Since February 2012, they have helped people take more than 17 million steps that would have otherwise been impossible. In the next five years, we could be seeing exoskeletons in construction sites all over the world. Eventually, they will be so lightweight, our clothes will be lined with exoskeletons that make us stronger and faster. And one day, this technology could replace the wheelchair altogether. For now, exoskeleton designers are taking it one step at a time. As someone who's benefited from wearing an exoskeleton robot, I look at the future and I see it, it's very bright. Wearing exoskeletons to me in 20 years is gonna be a normal thing, like putting on pants in the morning instead of transferring into my wheelchair. I'll just get up and it'll be a daily thing for me and I'll have a normal active life.